So we'll show that the Shatton class is a UMD using the Kotlar identity. And incidentally, this is historically, I think, one of the first proofs of boundedness of the Hilbert transform, even in the scalar valued setting. Bootstrapping from L2 up to general LP and then using duality, this is a, a classic proof that's nice even in the scalar case. So you'll get to see this proof. Proof that Shatton classes uh, UMD. So let's just write CP instead of CPH because we're only dealing with one Hilbert space here and it, it's just going to take too long to write H every time. Although in a, in a proof we're going to do on Thursday, we will move between different Hilbert spaces, which sounds weird, but we'll do that. So there's a duality theorem, which I didn't state and which we won't prove, which says that the dual of CP can be naturally identified with CP prime, just as in the case of LP spaces. You kind of expect this to be true. Everything's based off LP, and it is true. The duality pairing sends a pair UV to the trace of UV. <laughs> That's the duality pairing. You know, usually the, the pairing between LP and LP prime is through the integral. You do the same thing, but with a trace. That works. So we know that a Barnack space is UMD if and only if it's dual spaces. So we need only consider P between two and infinity, because then we can dualize and get between one and two. That's very helpful. Let's let this constant A sub P be the norm of the Hilbert transform on the torus as an operator on LP of the torus valued in CP. What we need to show is that AP is finite for all P greater than or equal to two, not including infinity. And we've stated that we're going to have constants that are independent of the choice of Hilbert space. We're going to see that in the proof that the, the control on AP that we get is going to have nothing to do with the choice of Hilbert space. So by interpolation, a result that's in the notes that I haven't stated here, uh, interpolation basically says if you have an operator that's bounded on, in LP, you know this, if you have an operator that's bounded on LP and also valid, uh, bounded on LQ, then it's bounded on LR for all R between P and Q. You can take boundedness at endpoints of an interval and get it in the middle of the interval as well. The same thing is true for the Shatton classes. If you have an operator that's bounded on CP and CQ, then it's bounded on CR for all R in between. And the same is even true when you take LP valued in CP and LQ valued in CQ. If you have an operator, if T maps LP, valued in CP to itself and also maps LQ valued in CQ to itself. Then it also maps LR valued in CR to itself for all R between P and Q. Does that make sense? Like, uh, uh, you don't need to see the proof of that for now. I mean, you can go and look it up if you want. There's a special case of this more general complex interpolation procedure. If you've got two Barnack spaces, you can define what's called intermediate spaces through the process of complex interpolation and whatever. I don't want to overcomplicate it. There's a discussion in the notes if you want to look at that. Basically, if we want to show that AP is finite for all P greater than two, you don't have to prove it for every P. It just suffices to do P equals two to the N. For n, in the, for n in the natural numbers. So therefore it suffices to prove that a to the two, a sub two to the n is finite for all natural numbers n, oh, n greater than or equal to one, not n equals zero. Because then we'll at least be able to say, okay, if the Hilbert transform is bounded at two n and at two n plus one, it's bounded everywhere in between. And we can do that for every n. All right, that's all we need to know about interpolation. So 
let's do an induction argument. Let's do the base case. We know that a sub two equals one. This is because L2 valid in C2 is a Hilbert space. C2 is a Hilbert space, as I said before, in a product coming from the trace. L2 valued in a Hilbert space is also naturally a Hilbert space. And so you're looking at boundedness of this Hilbert transform on this Hilbert space and you use Poincaré's theorem. And you say, okay, the norm of this Fourier multiplier is equal to the L infinity norm of its symbol, which is one, because the symbol is just minus I times the sine of Xi. So we can take P equals two as a base case. We know that A sub two is actually one. And the important thing is that this one doesn't depend on the choice of Hilbert space as you can plainly see, one is independent of H. We proceed by induction. Let's assume A sub P is finite and prove that A sub two P is finite. And in showing this, we're gonna see that everything's gonna be independent of H as well. Although I haven't explicitly said that in the inductive hypothesis. Let's take P greater than or equal to two. Okay, everyone clear with that general outline of what we're gonna do? We're gonna take this boundedness on the Hilbert space, Hilbert space and then raise the power or multiply the exponent by two repeatedly and get all the powers of two and that'll do. Okay. So this argument uses the Kotler identity. As I said, we're going to be able to relate C2P with CP and then relate to Hilbert transform with some products of Hilbert transforms and things. But what we're going to need to do as well is a bit of a truncation argument. In this argument, we're kind of implicitly going to assume what we're trying to prove, that this operator is actually bounded at C2P. And then we're going to take this a priori finiteness and actually replace it with something that's quantitative. Like we're going to, assuming that it's finite, we're going to get an explicit bound in terms of a sub p. And the way to make this argument work is to do a truncation argument. We're going to work on a subspace where actually the Hilbert transform is already bounded. We're going to have some parameterization in n and we're going to show stuff that's independent of n. So let's make the definitions we need to make for this argument. For all n, we're going to define this space P sub n valid in C2P. This is the C2P valued trigonometric polynomials of degree up to n. So we're going to look at finite degree trigonometric polynomials. That's our truncation argument. So this is functions f from the torus to the Shatten class that are trigonometric polynomials such that the Fourier coefficients vanish for all M of size greater than N. So it's what you'd usually think of when you think of a trigonometric polynomial of, of degree up to N. And we'll define our constant A2P N. So this constant we're trying to show is finite. We're gonna take a restricted version where we just consider trigonometric polynomials up to degree N. To write it out explicitly, it's the supremum over f in p sub n, which are non-zero of the norm of the Hilbert transform of f in L2p, valued in C2p, divided by the norm of f. So it's, it's the norm of the Hilbert transform restricted to trigonometric polynomials of degree up to n. And because we're working with essentially a finite dimensional space of trigonometric polynomials, they're valued in an infinite dimensional space, but the analysis is essentially finite dimensional. This is finite without any extra assumptions. That's an exercise. So what's happening here is that we don't know that A sub 2P, this norm on L2P, we don't know that that's finite. But if we restrict to the trigonometric polynomials of degree N, we'd know a priori it is finite. We just don't necessarily have uniform control in N. And that's what we need to show. Need uniform control in N. It's like when we dealt with truncated Hilbert transforms, we knew that we had bounded operators in the beginning. The trick was to show some uniformity in the parameters. Okay. 
Okay. So by, before we actually prove this, by density of the trigonometric polynomials, oops, not P sub n, all trigonometric polynomials in L2P, P is not infinity, so the trigonometric polynomials are dense in here. We have that the norm of the Hilbert transform on L2P is actually given as the limit as the degree goes to infinity of this restricted norm. We're going to use that later. So let's fix such a trigonometric polynomial, degree up to n, valid in C2P. And let's compute the Hilbert transform of that just to, to estimate this norm A sub 2P n. So we're taking the L2P norm. Let's square it for convenience so we don't have to write so many brackets and things. That'll help us. First, let's just write out what this is. To the 2p, dt, we have 2 on 2p because we have that square there. So that's a start. And remember, we have this identity that lets us reduce the Schatten 2p norm down to a p norm by replacing u with u star u. We apply that here and we get, so u star times u in CP rather than C2P. And this 2P up here becomes a P because we divide by two in the exponent to make this work. And we still have here, well, now this is one on P just simplifying the fraction. So we have this little term here that we need to deal with. This adjoint of the Hilbert transform of F. This is a pointwise adjoint, basically. For each T, you have an adjoint of this operator. And another little exercise, which is sort of straightforward, is that this is actually the Hilbert transform of the pointwise adjoint of F at T. You can put the adjoint inside the Hilbert transform. Basically, what's happening here is this, um, this Hilbert transform is a vector valid extension of a scalar valued Hilbert transform, and that doesn't see any of the, the adjoint action that can happen. You should check that by hand, it works. Nothing happens in that second factor. So we have this times that, a lot of brackets. And this can be written as HT of F star, Hilbert transform of the adjoint, pointwise adjoint of F times the Hilbert transform of F in LP, valid in CP. So this is the first step in the reduction from C2P down to CP, except now we have a product to deal with, product of Hilbert transforms. And if you didn't know the Kotler identity, you'd be stuck. But we know from the Kotler identity that product of Hilbert transforms here can actually be written in terms of other stuff. So we're going to write that out. So let's control that using Kotler. We can control this by the Hilbert transform of some stuff that'll write out F star times Hilbert transform of F plus Hilbert transform of F star times F. And let's just use a triangle inequality here. We have this term and we have another term, which is just F star times F in LP valued in CP. That's where we use the Kotler identity. So then what can we do now? Here we're looking at the Hilbert transform on LP valued in CP. And that's where the inductive hypothesis comes in. We've assumed a bound here. This is bounded by A sub P, the norm of that operator times the norm of what's on the inside. And we can use the triangle inequality again, just write that as a sum of two terms. Sort of bracket there. Plus this term here that hasn't been changed yet. 
So all of these norms are in LP. And we've gotten rid of one of the Hilbert transforms, at least. There's still some other Hilbert transforms lying around here. But what we do now is we use a Holder inequality. Actually, what we're using here is a non-commutative Holder inequality. So I haven't stated this, but there's a Holder inequality for the Schatten classes. If you take the product of two operators and you estimate the norm of that, you can write that in terms of the norm of the, the two operators, just as in Holder's inequality for functions, the same exponents, the same numerology, everything's the same. And it also works for LP valued and CP. You have a Holder inequality for those. So just by using holder, this is a sub p, f star in L2p, valued in C2p, times the Hilbert transform of f, also in L2p. I'm just going to write 2p here because the norms are going to get annoying. So I write 2p, that's L2p valued in C2p. Same here. And same there. So what I'm using here is that one on two p plus one on two p is equal to one on p. This is the Holder inequality numerology that you need to check, and it, it works, right? So now we've got some Hilbert transforms acting on L two p. <laughs> and then you think, hang on, our inductive hypothesis is that we know how the Hilbert transform acts on L p, right? But actually, we have this a priori boundedness on trigonometric polynomials of degree up to n. So what we can take out here is not a sub 2p, but a sub 2p n. These degree n constants that we're working with the whole time. Because f here is in p n, f star is also in p n. If f is a trigonometric polynomial of degree n, then so is f star. <laughs> so we can take out the constants a sub 2p n. We get the norm of f in L2p uh, squared because the norm of f star in the Schatten class is the same as the norm of f. The star doesn't change anything, as I said before. So we've got f squared, f squared, same here, f squared. Like that. All of these norms are L2P valid in C2P. And we can write this as A sub P, A sub 2P N, two of those. Uh, hang on, I don't want to plus one. Yep, F squared 2P. So we're at the stage that we can say that because we were estimating from the beginning, we are estimating a sub 2pn, because we're just looking at degree n trigonometric polynomials. This tells us that a sub 2pn is less than or equal to 2 times a sub p, a sub 2pn plus 1. That's what we get. Does that make sense? I have the squared on both sides here. Does that mess us up at all? No, it doesn't. Two. Yeah. If we take the square root of both sides, we see that we'll get actually what we get directly is that, and then we just square both sides. So I can forget that. So anyway, we're, we're here. I've forgotten a square somewhere, haven't I? Yeah, that's what we need. <laughs> is that right? No, hang on. I've forgotten a square somewhere. Where have I forgotten my square? Ah, we're estimating a sub 2pn squared. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's where I forgot the square. This is what we have. That makes more sense. Okay. I don't know whether that's a mistake in my notes or not. It could be. Anyway. So how do we go from this to some control on A sub 2pn? We end up writing it out as a quadratic equation in A sub 2pn. So this minus 2ap A 2pn 
minus one less than or equal to zero is a quadratic inequality and we can solve that using the quadratic formula. And what we find is that a sub two p n is less than or equal to a p plus the square root of a p squared minus one. There you go. And therefore by taking n to infinity because the right hand side doesn't depend on n, a sub two p, which is the limit of these things as n goes to infinity is less than or equal to a sub p plus a sub p squared minus one root. And if this right hand side doesn't depend on h, then neither does the left hand side. So this is all h independent. And of course this right hand side's finite by the inductive hypothesis, so good. That's the proof, that's it. So this tells you that the Shatton classes are UMD for all P between one and infinity, not including one, not including infinity, just as with classical LP spaces. So let me just make a quick remark. If you take this recurrence inequality or whatever you want to call it, and you work with it a little bit, what this actually tells you in the end is that A sub P is less than or equal to eight on pi times the maximum of P and P prime. So that's just a little bit of sharper control of the UMB constants of the Shatton classes. This isn't fully sharp, but I think the only thing that's not sharp here is the, the constant out the front, but I don't care about that. So the important thing for me is that these UMD spaces, these spaces are UMD uniformly in the Hilbert space. Okay. Yep. If we start with a two equals one and use this inequality, why don't we keep getting one? Uh, probably because I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> why do, should that be plus one instead of minus one? Uh, I mean, you're right. Like this definitely does look like if AP is one, if A2 is one, then A2 looks like you should get a one minus one. Yeah, I think there's a mistake somewhere. The, maybe it's plus one. That would make more sense. Let's solve the equation here. At least if you just put it in here. If AP, A, yeah, AP is one, then A2P and squared is less than two. Yeah. Is this is correct. Minus two, AP, minus one, zero. So the roots are, if we look at an X, two AP plus or minus four AP squared minus four on two. What's that? AP plus minus AP squared. That's a plus four, plus one. Yeah, that should be a plus, not a minus. Good catch. How's that? Bit more plausible. Any other issues? Any other mistakes that I've made? Uh, this this is a, maybe a my, because, uh, I, I have a small question. Yeah. I think this is not like super important in this context, but uh, if you just say that, uh, uh, if you just prove that the UMD constant is bounded for any, is, is finite for any Hilbert space without saying that uh, it is uh, independent of the Hilbert space, uh, uh, that you show that will so, that would actually be enough but you need a little yeah. bit of extra argument like you can deduce the fact that it's actually bounded independently of the hilbert space from that the, the yeah. thing you need to show actually is that the the umd constant of the shatten class cph is the supremum of the umd constants for shatten classes on finite dimensional hilbert spaces yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and that's not even too difficult like you know how when we do the right uh, is it is it only is it only finite dimensional or aha uh -huh, uh -huh, okay yeah so actually when you look at finite dimensional hilbert spaces you know the, your, your shatten classes are finite dimensional so the umd but you can actually say that the the umd constant of a shatten class is the U, is the supremum of an infinite dimensional shatten class <laughs> i should say umd constant of that is the supremum of umd constants of finite dimensional shatten classes because when you take martingales valued in the space without loss of generality, you can take simple martingales, martingales made of simple functions. So without loss of generality, you can assume that 
all of your martingales live in a finite dimensional subspace of the space. We did the same argument with the Rado nicotine property, actually. Mm -hmm. We said that the Rado nicotine property is separably determined, like you only need to look at separable subspaces. Turns out with the UMD property, you only need to look at finite dimensional subspaces and then take a supremum over all of them. That gives you the UMD constants. Oh, okay, UMD is what's called a local property, only depends on the finite dimensional subspaces. So yeah, uh, I've done this argument purely so that I don't have to do that reduction, but now I've done that reduction in words. So now you know how to do it that way too. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So we know that Shatten class is a UMD. What can we do with that? That's all well and good. I mean, we kind of intrinsically care about UMD spaces, but why would you do that? Like what's so good about this? I said that there are some um, surprising or unnatural applications of Barnack valued analysis. So there must be some theorem that I'm going to show you that has nothing to do with Barnack valued analysis. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Skip forward in my notes to get to the theorem. I need to talk a little bit about the spectral theorem to state this theorem. I mean, most of you probably know the spectral theorem, but just to refresh your memory, if you have an operator U, which is compact, and self-adjoint. These assumptions are overkill. Actually, self-adjoint is enough. You don't even really need it to be bounded. The self-adjoint is good. But if you have a compact and self-adjoint operator, there exists a spectral resolution of U. And what that means is you have a sequence, which we'll call E sub lambda, where lambda is in the spectrum of U, if you remember what the spectrum of U is, of mutually orthogonal projections. So these E lambdas are elements of L of H. Actually, they're finite rank operators there. Okay, I haven't said it, but they're finite rank projections. They're essentially mapping onto the eigenspaces of the operator U. such that the operator U can actually be written as a sum over the elements of the spectrum, lambda, lambda, E sub lambda. This is the spectral resolution of U. It says U can be basically decomposed into its eigenspaces. It's a Jordan normal form of U if you have used a finite dimensional linear algebra, basically. I should say H is a complex Hilbert space throughout all this. I haven't mentioned that. I'm thinking only of complex Hilbert spaces. It's not really a big deal, but whatever. When you have this spectral resolution of U like this, if you have a function F that maps the spectrum of U into the complex numbers, if it's continuous, I should mention the spectrum of U when U is compact and self adjoint looks like this. Here's your complex numbers. Here's the origin. Here is, whoops. Here is the norm of U. And your spectrum will be a, a sequence with cluster point at the origin. That's what the spectrum of a compact operator looks like. Cluster at the origin. So I'm asking for this function f that it's continuous on what is essentially a discrete set, but it clusters at the origin. So I do need some continuity at the origin. That's the only place where the continuity condition comes in. If f's continuous, It's, it's bounded because it's going to be bounded at zero because it has to converge there. Let's just say and bounded just to be really careful. We can define f of u. So u is an operator and f is a function on scalars. So f of u is defined through this spectral resolution by acting on each of these lambdas. All right. This is the spectral theorem for compact self-adjoint operators, or what you call functional calculus. I have some lecture notes on functional calculus from a course I taught a couple of years ago. You can go read them more generally. But this whole process of defining functions of operators is called functional calculus, and it's kind of a field in itself. Functional calculus of U. And this way of defining functions of the operator is very useful in applications because sometimes you want to construct operators with certain properties and you can reduce it down to constructing functions with certain properties, functions just on the real line. 
and often that's easy to do. So this is a powerful tool. You have, for example, that the norm of f of u as a bounded linear operator is actually controlled by the L infinity norm of f times the operator norm of u. So this correspondence of functions to operators is bounded <laughs> in a sense. But one question, it's a very important question in, in the perturbation theory of operators. If u and v are operators that are close in some sense, of course you can choose different norms to measure the closeness. If, the, if u minus v is small, and remember with this lecture, I started talking about what can you mean by smallness of, of an operator. If the difference between u and v is small, are f u and f v close? So if you can define f of u and f of v, and if f is small in some sense, and if u and v are close in some sense, are f of u and f of v still close? This is continuity of this function or calculus as you vary the underlying operator, but not vary the function. So it's this continuity of functional calculus in the operator. And yeah, so the, this question can be formulated in a lot of ways, depending on what functions f you take, what operators u and v you take, what measure of closeness you put on them. And sometimes the answer is yes, they're close. Sometimes the answer is no, they're not as you expect with this kind of question it's sort of deep it's not always true so the theorem will prove which is by Potapov Sukhochev in 2011 this is new and the one Australian in the audience probably knows both of these people because they're at UNSW <laughs> uh, University of New South Wales for those who don't know Potapov Sukhochev theorem 2011 Let's take H to be Hilbert space and P between one and infinity. And let's take U and V to be compact self-adjoint operators on the Hilbert space H. And we'll assume that U and V are close in the following sense. U minus V is in the Shatton P class. Oh, my headphone fell out. <laughs> really should get some wireless ones. Okay. So we'll assume that U and V have difference in the Shatton class. We're also assuming that U and V are compact and self-adjoint. This theorem actually holds for general unbounded self-adjoint operators. The compactness isn't necessary. We're just going to use it to make things easier. And suppose the function F that we're going to take, it maps the real line to itself and it's Lipschitz. So remember Lipschitz means f of t minus f of s divided by t minus s is finite or supremum over t not equal to s. Lipschitz condition on f. Then the difference between f of u and f of v in the Shatton p class, that's where we're measuring our closeness, is bounded by a constant depending only on p by the Lipschitz norm of f, which is this quantity up here, times the difference between u and v in the Shatton class. So this closeness, this continuity of the function of calculus does hold for a Lipschitz function if you measure closeness in the Shatton norms for p greater than one. So we can rewrite this incidentally as f of u minus f of v norm in CPH divided by u minus v in CPH, supremum over u not equal to v in uh, compact self adjoint operators, like that, bounded by some constant times the Lipschitz function of f. So what this is saying is that the Lipschitz function f is operator Lipschitz. <laughs> so if you measure this, instead of measuring the Lipschitz condition like this, where you plug in scalars, if you plug in operators in a certain class, you still have this Lipschitz condition. And that's a very subtle thing. You can't deduce that directly at all just from the Lipschitz condition of F. This is proven in 2011. This is 10 years ago. This is new. <laughs> all right. It's quite impressive. So we're going to prove this. This doesn't look like a 
theorem that has anything to do with Barnack valued analysis. I mean, there are some Barnack spaces involved, right? The, the Schatten norms are here, the Schatten classes. They are UMD Barnack spaces, and we're going to use that. But this is not a question about Barnack valued functions at all. So that's why it's a bit surprising that that technique would come in. We'll prove that on Thursday, but we're going to build up to the proof of that with some preliminary results. I've done my notes out of order. Let me find what I need to do next. That's done, that's done. Okay. I've got to pick that up later. Um, we have to talk about sure multipliers. The, the technical tool that's going to get us this theorem of what are called sure multipliers, which some of you might have seen before. Sure multipliers are a lot like Fourier multipliers, but on matrices or on operators. So just to show what a sure multiplier is in the finite dimensional case, because there it's the easiest to see what they are. Given a, an n by n matrix U over the complex numbers, and given another n by n matrix M, M is the, the symbol of the multiplier, just like with Fourier multipliers. The Schur multiplier, which we'll call M sub capital M, some small M, whatever, of U, is the matrix where you take the matrix of U and then you just multiply it component-wise by the matrix N in the naive way. So you've got M, you know, all of the other terms appearing here. So what you have is the ij coordinate of this matrix is m ij u ij. Basically, your first guess for matrix multiplication when you're in school and you don't know what matrix multiplication is. That's what a sure multiplier is. It turns out it actually does come up naturally. Like this naive matrix multiplication has a purpose. <laughs> it's just not what you not what you think. So this is the sure multiplier of u by m. I think this is sometimes written as like m star u with some particular type of star, but whatever. It's not important. So we're going to do this on, on operators rather than on matrices, on infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So we need to have some kind of infinite matrix representation, which you can do through like a basis or whatever. We're going to do it through a spectral resolution so that we can link it to spectral theory rather than directly working with bases. So in general, if you have a, if you have a Hilbert space H, then we're going to define a countable spectral resolution these are the things that come up in the spectral theorem for compact operators basically countable spectral resolution is a sequence e lambda lambda in some subset lambda capital lambda of the real line which is countable Sequence of pairwise orthogonal projections. Just to remind you what that means in case you've forgotten and didn't speak up. The fact that their projection says that E lambda squared is E lambda. That's what a projection is. And pairwise orthogonality says that E lambda E mu equals E mu E lambda equals zero if lambda is not equal to mu. Basically, they correspond to pairwise orthogonal subspaces of the Hilbert space, and they are the projections onto those subspaces. Countable spectral resolution is such a sequence. It's countable indexed by a subset of the real line, such that for every vector h in the Hilbert space, h is the sum over the spectral resolution of E lambda h. Basically, the sum of the E lambdas is the identity operator, but the convergence is in the strong operator topology which means you just consider every vector and do it vector-wise. And because these are orthogonal projections, this sum can be taken in any order you like. You have unconditionality. The order of the sum doesn't matter. We're working with Hilbert spaces here, so we actually have orthogonality to work with. Okay. So we're going to define sure multipliers in terms of spectral resolutions rather than in terms of matrices because that turns out to be the natural thing to do. So given 
a countable spectral resolution. Called E lambda on a Hilbert space H. And given an infinite matrix, coefficients m sub, sub lambda mu. So lambda and mu are in this indexing set lambda, and we just use that indexing set to make an infinite matrix. These coefficients are all complex numbers. The sure multiplier uh, m sub m with respect to e is the operator acting on bounded linear operators on the Hilbert space, although we're going to define it as a formal sum that doesn't necessarily converge. The sure multiplier acting on u is the sum over lambda and mu in the indexing set of m lambda mu e sub lambda u e sub mu for all u the bounded linear operators. So if you write this out in the finite dimensional case and you take a spectral projection corresponding to your basis, this is exactly the sure multiplier from before. This is saying, you know, go from mu to lambda with respect to this spectral resolution, which is kind of like a basis and then chuck these coefficients in there. If you're used to this kind of linear algebra, that will be clear. If you're not, have a think about it for a second. It's basically what we wrote before. So the problem is this sum doesn't necessarily converge. It doesn't necessarily make sense. But if your operator u is finite rank, the sum is finite. Because at least in the co-domain, there is only gonna be a finite dimensional space that matters and you're very quickly gonna exhaust that with your spectral resolution. So most of the lamb, most of the, yeah, most of the only finitely many lambdas and mu's are going to matter here. Is that true? <laughs> I'm not sure about mu. Maybe lambda. We'll do everything formally. It'll all work out in the end. So the problem with the Schur multiplier, just as with Fourier multipliers, you can define it with a given symbol, but you don't know that it's going to give you a bounded operator on various different spaces. If you're working on the space C2 of Hilbert-Schmidt operators, you could, you've got a Hilbert space, you can use orthogonality. I think all that matters is that the symbol is bounded and then you have a bounded operator. As with the Poincharel theorem for Fourier multipliers, it's easy for Hilbert spaces. But for P02, you can ask, is this is this sure multiplier bounded on CPH for various values of P. And this Potapov-Sukhachev theorem we want to prove will actually reduce down to that question for certain sure multipliers. So we have this question that we need to consider. And just to end the lecture, we'll do one simple lemma, the simplest possible sure multipliers We'll bound them. Let's take a countable spectral resolution. Of a Hilbert space H. And let's suppose that our symbol M is bounded and diagonal. You know what it means for matrix to be diagonal. The coefficients are zero if lambda is not equal to mu. Simplest possible sure multipliers. Then for all u of finite rank, where I claim the sure multiplier is automatically well defined, but I'm starting to question that. And for all p between one and infinity, including one, we don't need any UMD type stuff here. The sure multiplier is bounded with norm bounded by 
the L infinity norm down the diagonal. I should have said um, M sub lambda is M sub lambda lambda. <laughs> That's what we define this function M to be. Yeah. So diagonal sure multipliers are bounded. Diagonal bounded sure multipliers are bounded under no real assumptions. The proof still, I mean, the proof's not exceptionally difficult, but there's a little bit of a trick in proving this that you need to know. And the proof involves taking our favorite sequences, Rademacher sequences. <laughs> on some probability space, Omega. We're not doing any Barnack valued analysis here, but Rademacher sequences come back in just because they're useful things. And then let's write this sure multiplier. In this case, we have a simple form because of the diagonalness. So you have E lambda, U E lambda. You usually have lambda and mu, but the off diagonal terms vanish because this is a diagonal multiplier. We can write this as the expected value of this product here where we take epsilon lambda m lambda e lambda times v wait what's v why am i writing v instead of u times u times another sum where now we reintroduce the off diagonal terms epsilon mu e mu the reason this is true is that if you expand these sums on the right hand side here you get off diagonal terms that involve epsilon lambda epsilon mu and then when you take the expectation of that you get zero. So you've reintroduced the off diagonal terms, but they don't actually contribute, right? But this is just a nice clever way of writing this out. It's a randomization argument, which is quite good. So when we want to evaluate the norm of this Schur multiplier in the Schatten class, you can take this representation, you've got a norm on the outside, and you can put the norm on the inside of the expectation. I should maybe write it like that. So this norm is less than or equal to the expectation of the norm of this product. In CPH. So now we have to pull another property out of nowhere of the Schatten classes, which is the operator ideal property. And I'll just tell you what that is. The ideal property. If you know algebra, an ideal in an algebra is a set which is stable under multiplication on the left or on the right. The same is true for ideals of, well, for operator algebras basically. The ideal property says that if A and B are bounded operators and U is in CP, then AUB is also in CP. And in fact, you have the norm of AUB in CP is less than or equal to the norm of A as a bounded operator. So the operator norm of A, the Schatten norm of U times the operator norm of B. This is the ideal property. You can get it from the approximation numbers pretty simply. You can also get it from this trace definition pretty simply if you're used to dealing with functional calculus, spectral theorem, whatever. So on the inside of this expectation, we can take this norm of the product and write that as less than or equal to the norm of this thing, just the operator norm times the Schatten norm of U times the operator norm of this. And this U part doesn't depend on the Rademacher variables at all. So we can just take that out of the expectation, doesn't contribute. And we just have to look at these things here. And you might think we're doing something subtle here. We have randomization. Maybe we need to control the norm of the expectation in a subtle way, but actually we just use a pointwise estimate. <laughs> we do something very easy here. For all omega in the probability space, let's just fix omega and look at the norm of these operators. We have epsilon lambda omega, m sub lambda, e sub lambda. What's this operator here? 
this E sub lambda is a spectral resolution. So it's basically when you sum these up, you get the identity operator. We've got some bounded coefficients and we have some plus or minus ones that are lying around. But by the orthogonality, I went right out the whole proof. If you write it out in terms of basis elements or whatever, this norm is actually just bounded by the L infinity norm of this sequence here. Simply enough. And multiplying the elements of a sequence by plus or minus one doesn't change the norm. So we get the L infinity norm of the, the diagonal of the multiplier. And the same thing is true for the other term, but even easier because you don't have any M's involved. This has got norm one. Or let's just say less than or equal to one, but it's actually equal to one. We only need less than or equal to here. So this expectation that appears above this one here is less than or equal to CP norm of U times the L infinity norm down the diagonal of the symbol independently of omega. And then you integrate in omega, <laughs> which does nothing. So that's your proof. I don't know if there are other proofs of this. I think you can prove this in other ways other than using this Rademacher averaging, but this is a nice little application of Rademacher techniques. You can bring in, well, you can, it lets you exploit orthogonality. Some, for Barnard valued stuff, it lets you bring in some orthogonality when you don't have it. But when you're working in a Hilbert space, this can help you deal with the orthogonality you have, certainly. So yeah, diagonal sure multipliers are bounded. That's gonna be useful later on. This is the end of the lecture. On Thursday, we're gonna prove the potapov sukhachev theorem by bounding more sure multipliers. We're gonna take sure multipliers with non-diagonal symbols and certain types of symbols can actually be reduced down to Fourier multipliers, strangely enough. And that's where we're gonna use the umd valley micklin theorem to bound those. Then we finally reduce potapov sukhachev down to sure multipliers of the right form, which takes a bit more Fourier analysis, also strangely enough. And in the end, everything will work. So that's gonna be Thursday.